uh, catch up on some time. So in this session, we are going to have a couple of talks on the biologics. So I think my task for the next 10 to 15 minutes is to make sure that you don't go to sleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to be very basic on the biology. It's kind of a complex uh, topic, and again, once once you see through some of the slides, you will know why. But hopefully, the first half is going to give you an idea of what is biologics and what are the different types and why we use it. And then my uh, colleague from Manchester, so he's going to go through the practical application of all those talk, uh, all those therapies. So, why? What is biological therapies? I was thinking about it, and I think what. what you just need to realize that whenever there is an injury, the body will try <coughs> to heal. That's the biology, that's the bi biological nature of any injury, that the body will try to heal. So all the biological therapies, what they are doing, is to enhance that healing potential of those, of those injuries. Okay, they're not doing anything extra, they're just helping the body to heal along the way. So biological approaches are used to treat orthopedic injuries, to improve the clinical outcomes and promote tissue regeneration and healing. They can be used either in isolation, or you do another procedure, and then you use biologics to augment the healing potential of that procedure, okay? Now again, there are different types of it, so they can use either the cells, and that's what the body does, or the body uses some growth factors, okay? So the biological, the utilization is the growth factors, your autologous blood products, and cells. So those are three things which you need to remember. And again, Growth factors and cytokines, that's the first thing. Second thing is your PRP, which is very hot in orthopedic sports uh, literature at the moment. And then you got your cell therapies. So cell therapies, that's where the stem cells come in. So we're not gonna cover the stem cells in the whole, but we are interested in the stem cells which can be used for the sports injury or orthopedic uh, management. If you look at the cells, so the cell therapies, so they could be either autologous chondrocyte implantation. What does that mean? That you took some cartilage cells from a human, you grow them in the lab, and then you put them back into the human or in the patient. So that's your autologous chondrocyte implantation. Or you've got mesenchymal stem cells. So mesenchyme, that's your connective tissue, and the mesenchymal stem cells are also called stroma cells. So those are your stem cells, basically, okay? And on those stem cells, the different ways, so they can come from either your bone marrow or they can come from the fat. And we will look into that in a little bit more detail later on, okay? But in a nutshell, if we talk about the biological therapies, it's either your growth factors and cytokines, you got your blood products, which is platelet-rich plasma is one of them, or you got cell therapies, which is either your chondrocyte, autologous chondrocyte, or you got your mesenchymal stem cells. How you prepare those mesenchymal stem cells from your bone marrow or from your fat will determine how effective they're gonna be. So that division here is either heterogeneous preparation, which is your bone marrow aspirate concentrate, or you got culture-derived mesenchymal stem cells, or you got mesenchymal stem cells which you have purified through different uh, preparation. First of all, let's just look at the growth factors. Now again, the slides are quite detailed. I'm not expecting you to read uh, or understand all of it. But again, this is a list of all the growth factors which have been worked on, okay? The one in the red, BMP2 and FDGF, so in certain states in America, they've got the FDA approval, okay? Now, if you look at systematically of all of them, so BMP is bone mar uh, morphogenic protein, now they all have different roles, and all those roles have been studied. There's a lot of basic science literature available for all those, as we will realize later on in the presentation, but very few clinical papers available, or good quality clinical papers at the moment. So again, common example, what we normally use, so BMP2, so it promotes your mesenchymal stem cells to the osteoblast or chondrocyte. So either you can help in the generation of the bone or healing of the fracture, or the, the chondrocytes or the cartilage, okay? So again, if you look at, so again, osteoblast, chondrocytes, so these are all the different growth factors you can use in the biological therapies. If we look at the second part, which was the platelet-rich plasma, which is basically you take some blood out of a patient, then you spin them in different machines, and we'll go through that, and then you will get a plasma which is rich in the platelets, okay? Important thing about those 
is that there, at the moment, there are more than 20 different companies with 20 different systems who can produce that platelet-rich plasma for you. If you look at the, the big companies which have been used here, you can see that the difference in the change of platelets, it varies a lot. They will have change in the leukocytes and they will change in the neutrophils. So if you are using a system from one company and you are trying to compare the results of your PRP application with the system used by another company for their platelet-rich plasma, you can't really compare it because they are different. Their increase in platelet fold is different. And the additional factor on that is that, that this is what the machine is doing out of that blood which you've taken. It also depends on the patient, their level of activity, it also, also how much platelets they have, and that will determine how much increase you will get. So it's not straightforward that you've got a PRP, and you say, right, okay, this is going to be effective because I know this is PRP, okay? There are a number of other cofactors which will determine how effective that is going to be. So you can start to look at how difficult it is to analyze any results from the studies because of the varied nature of all the products which are available. In the PRP, so we'll go back. In the PRP, now again, yes, the platelet-rich plasma, but then it's not just, just the plasma. So you've got other things as well. So you've got proteins, electrolytes, hormones, so all those things are present in your PRP. So it's very difficult to say which of that is which is causing the effect. So cause and effect is quite difficult to be <coughs> certain in, 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 in that. So again, no need to re read through and remember all of those, but this is just to highlight that there are other things present in the PRP. Now, we talked about um, the PRP. Now we're going to talk about the cell therapies. Remember, the cell therapies are the stem cells, okay, or the mesenchymal stromal cells or stem cells. This slide is an overview from one of the paper how the cell therapies can help. So cell therapies, if they are differentiated cells, then you can use those differentiated cells, for example, chondrocytes, your tenocytes, or your fibroblast, and you put it into the injured tissue as an engraft tissue, and supposedly they will help to recover that injured part of your uh, injured part of the body. The other way which we are interested in, which we are discussed, is the mesenchymal stem cells. So these cells, they are differentiated, so they can't grow into everything else. If they are if they're growing into chondrocytes, so they are just going to stick with the function which they have. The beauty of the mesenchymal stem cells is that they can grow into any of the lineage. Okay? So mesenchymal stem cells, <coughs> so they can differentiate and they can go into the injured tissue, whatever that injured tissue is, either it is a cartilage or it is a tendon or it is a skin. Along with that, they've got other actions. So they've got an anti-inflammatory action. Now all those cells, they do not work in isolation. They have to interact. Remember what we talked about, the, the injury environment. So the injury environment, there will be growth factor there. There will be stem cells already present there. So they need to work in, in concert with all the other factors around it before they can decide what they're going to do. So not just the, the cell, which is the, the main, main uh, factor here. So for example, if they're interacting with a immune tissue response, then they will produce the anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And again, those are all the different factors which will, uh, which, which will express. Or if they're interacting with the local cells, so the local cells, for example, in the endothelial, then they have those properties, anti-apoptotic, anti-fibrotic, mitotic, antigenic properties. And again, those are all the different factors which will be expressed. So those are all the growth factors which we mentioned in the very beginning, okay? Or they can uh, interact with the progenitor cell and then um, they will reproduce th these uh, factors, okay? So it's not, so the same cells under different conditions, injury conditions, and with different <coughs> interaction with other cells, they can produce different results. So when, so what is a stem cell? So there is a criteria by International Society of Cell and Gene Therapy. So in order for any stem cell to be classified as a music uh, cell to be classified as a stem cell, so they need to be adhered to a plastic culture plate. Then they need to have the capacity to differentiate into the three lineages, either osteoblast, adipocyte, or chondroblast in vitro. And then they need to be able to specific expression of profiles for cell surface markers. If they can fulfill those three criteria, then they will be called as stem cells. 
So my initial when I started looking into the topic, I sort of said there's something new and fancy which just come up in the, in, the, in the last few years. But no, if you look at the timeline, so it was in 1867, and this guy here, he noted that the fibroblast aid in the healing process. There was a lot of silence since then, but in 1966, uh, this gentleman here, he identified uh, the role of the osteogenic cells. The person who coined the term of mesenchymal stem cell, uh, that was Kaplan, and that was in 1990. <coughs> so it's 1990s up to now in the last sort of uh, 20, uh, 30 year, 20 years or so, that's where there is an expansion. And the most expansion was in that era, from 1999 to 2007, when the mesenchymal stem cells were isolated from different tissue. So they're from the, from the bone, from the fat, from the heart, from the um, umbilical cord, from the skin, from the lungs. That's where then 2006, that's where the definition comes into action. Um, and then in 2008, 2009, so th these are two important uh, discoveries that those stem cells are present around the perivascular region. Um, in 2017, so there's a group from Edinburgh uh, in collaboration with um, Dr. Pratt from the States. So they have set up a minimum reporting criteria. Because of the same reason, we, we mentioned about the PRPs. It's even worse for the, for the mesenchymal stem cell. If you do not have a benchmark, you can't really say what you've injected and what outcomes you're gonna have, okay? So they set up a minimum reporting criteria for the clinical studies using the stem cells. And most of the good quality journals now will look into that, that if they have adhered to that criteria, then they will accept any publication. And then in to, to last year, so now there are over 800 either completed or ongoing clinical trials included involving the mesenchymal stem cell. So I mentioned about the regenerative products, so mesenchymal stem cells, and there are two ways you can derive them. So you can use them either, you can get them from the fat, so ellipose derived mesenchymal stem cell, or you can get them from the bone marrow derived stem cell, okay? Now, again, a complex slide, the only thing to remember from here, that when you, when you derive those, it's not just the stem cells you get. You get those differentiated cells, you get those progenitor cells, and then, yes, you get some stem cells. Similarly, on the bone marrow aspirate or bone marrow concentrate, you get the differentiated cells, you get progenitor cells, and then yes, you do get some stem cells, okay? So how, remember what I mentioned about that you've got the mesenchymal stem cells, now it's a matter of how you prepare them. And again, this is the simple slide suggesting that you got the bone marrow aspirate, you can get it from the fat as well, adipose tissue, but then you just centrifuge, that's the most commonly used. You centrifuge them, you got the bone marrow aspirate concentrate, and that, and that's a number of companies are making those machines now. And then you use them in the clinical use. It's, the advantages are the machine is there, it's easily isolated, you can immediately use it, and then FDA considers it as a low risk procedure. The disadvantage is there that this is heterogeneous. So you do not have any control what you get. So you just spin it, you see what you get, okay? So some people nowadays suggest that you will look at the quality and the quantity of those cells which you got in that mixture. Um, again, disadvantage is reduce efficacy, considerable debris poorness. Or you, what you do is go one step further. So you take the cells, you enrich them in the culture, but obviously any enrichment will take some time. So it's two to four weeks in the culture. Then you have culture-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and then you will <coughs> do it in the clinical use. So again, unlimited yield, so you can grow as many as you want in the, in the lab, uh, and they're well characterized. But again, it's a uh, delayed procedure, it's costly. And then the last one is purified. So now again, that's most expensive, okay? So you've got a machine, a fluorescence activated cell sorting machine, which will sort out all the different cells. So what you get is the pure, purified mesenchymal stem cell, and then you use it in the clinical use. So this is quite heterogeneous, this is purified. But in order to do that, um, it's, it's difficult, okay? It will take time, uh, it's <coughs> another surgery, okay? And then it's quite expensive, um, and it needs expertise and regulatory hurdles. So again, these are not easily improved by the regulatory authorities. Now, the next few slides, again, they're quite busy slides, so I don't want you to, 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 to look through the whole slide. I'm just gonna give you a message from that slide, and I think that's probably for the, for the rest of the talk now. So using those different cell types, a number of studies have been done, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, so there are studies using the tenocytes for the tendons, 
for skin, for cartilage, for bone marrow concentrate. Um, this is um, fat, fat graft, and then again, a mixture of all those. So again, this is how you take it, and this is just an, an overview of the advantages and disadvantages of using the different. Um, now, you might have noticed that the four here is big, and that's deliberate, because four means that there are a number of randomized studies, or there's a lot of work already been done on those cells, okay? If they are in the early stage, then there's all two A, two A, okay? So it's from one to four, so there are only the cart chondrocytes, so that most of the work has been done on chondrocytes, the rest of it is pretty much earlier on. In one of the paper, the PRPs were used in all those different parts of the body, so rotator car, fracture healing, muscle injury, ACL, plantar fasciitis, uh, Achilles tendon, Epinia, picondylitis. So all those studies have been done using the PRPs. Now, for the conservative management, <coughs> again, you don't need to go into the details, but a number of studies have been done for the conservative management. That's using the PRPs for different um, problems. Um, either it could be epicondylitis or any degenerative um, tendon conditions. Uh, and again, all of them, so I think there are two things we can look at. Most of them are cases. The two things we can look at, look at the safety, if they've caused any more damage. In most of them are hardly any which they will cause any more damage. The second thing is to prove the efficacy. They all prove that yes, there is some improvement. But there's no way to determine, or other way to say that there's no not enough randomized controlled trials to say, look, doing the biological therapy is much better than using something else. Okay, so there are a few studies <coughs> comparing the hyaluronic acid with the biological therapy or using placebo. There are not, not many studies. So they all report improvement in the outcomes, but none of them is uh, robust enough to say, right, this is now a standard practice and everyone should use it. And then a number of um, those cell products have been used in combination with surgery. So that surgery, um, again, could be um, based on different types. Okay, so for example, they've been used in the ankle for the osteochondral defect and they've um, put on the minimum style cells. Um, <coughs> and again, there was only one study which was a multi or a pilot uh, randomized trial. The rest of them, again, they're all cases. If you're interested, I can send you a copy of this paper. So, in summary, we all agree from the basic science literature that the growth factors and the cell types, they have role in the healing potential. And the musculoskeletal tissue engineering has made it possible to apply that basic science knowledge into the clinical practice. However, we need to be sure that when we're using those biological therapies, we do understand the injury environment and the biological therapy being uh, delivered. Because as we s might have noticed that not all the biological therapies are the same. Even if on by the face of it, it looks like it's a PRP, and by the face of it, it looks like it's a stem cell, with, with the different methods of preparation, they're not exactly the same. So hopefully this has given you just an overview of what a biological therapy is, what are the different types, and yes, there's a lot of research happening about those at the moment. And then if any questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, we'll uh, get Mr. Shocks to give the next half of the presentation. <coughs>